and I hope you were there, and I hope you were able to enjoy the OA birthday last week too. Uh, it's nice to be back here with our group. Um, the OA birthday was just fabulous, just fabulous. And, and again, I hope that you were able to join us via Zoom. It was an unprecedented success. We had over 1,600 people that attended via Zoom uh, the OA birthday. And the recordings will be available soon. Uh, and this year, unlike years past, you will be able to access those recordings uh, if you paid your money into the birthday. But anyway, here we are. It is January the 23rd, 2021. Here we are, thank God. And we're going to study the big book. And just to bring you back up to speed, just to kind of get us rolling again, get our sea legs going again. Last week, not last week, but the week before, sorry, the week before we studied step three and four, chapter five, the two most misunderstood steps, three and four. And why they're misunderstood is a mystery to me, but how they're misunderstood is very clear. And how they are misunderstood is we have a tendency, we have a temptation to make them into something that they are not, to make them into this grandiose, unbelievable pageant of activity, and they were never intended to be as such. The third step is a very, very simple step. What does it say? It says we made a decision to turn our will, which is our thinking, and our life, which is our action, over to the care and direction, over to God, over to the care and direction of God. How do we do that? Do we do that in step three? No, we do not. We don't do that in step three. What step three is, is a decision. Now this morning when I got up, I was lucky enough to get up. I did my 11th step. <clears throat> and the first step I work every day is 11 because it says upon awakening, it doesn't say after, you know, after I uh, play my xylophone, which I don't have, or after I watch some television or something, uh, except for my bladder and it's in, you know, it's urgent calling. The first step I work every day is step 11. And then I go into my day and I said to myself, as I was having breakfast this morning, Today is big book and I, we're going to be studying, we're going to be beginning chapter six. That is a decision that we're going to do this. But unless that decision is followed up with action, step four, action, which means I have to walk over to the computer. I have to not only come over to the computer, but I have to enter in the Zoom information and I have to have my big book and I have to be ready to talk about whatever it is that we're going to be talking about that day. So all step three basically is, is a decision to do what? To do steps four through 12 every day for the rest of my life. And how do I specifically do that? I will do a fourth step and I will do a fourth step at some point in the future or tomorrow or today or what have you. But I'm gonna do uh, four through 12 every day. And how do I do that? By doing 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, and 12. In 10, we continue. In 11, we improve. And in 12, we practice. And in doing 10, 11, and 12, and we'll see when we get there, that this is actually going back to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12. And that's going to be happening as many times during the day that I need it. And we're going to blow out of the water when we get to step 10. Some of the misconceptions about step 10, but the major misconceptions about steps three and four are that they are somehow more grand, more elaborate, and definitely more complicated than they really are. We have a temptation at times to overcomplicate, overthink things when they are very, very simple indeed. And then we looked at step 12, or excuse me, step four. We looked at step four, and what we found is that it is a simple process resentments, four columns for resentments. Column one, who or what did made us, who or what do we resent? And in some cases it's a who, and in some cases it's a what. 
and I shared with you that I had a resentment against the expression, blood is thicker than water. Because whenever somebody said blood is thicker than water, I was immediately left out because I don't have blood relatives like that. I don't have aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews. I don't have that. So when somebody would say, oh, blood is thicker than water, it immediately put me on the outside looking in. And I had a resentment against certain things, certain institutions. I had a resentment against the fact that the clothing industry, that which advertises itself as big and tall, uh, didn't always go as big as I needed it to go. And, and so I had some different resentments. But the resentments are very simple. Column one, who or what do you resent? Column two, why do you resent them in 19 words or less? Column three, what basic instinct or instincts are affected? And if you need a review on the basic instincts, I would suggest strongly listening to a recording of last week or the week before. Now, when I say last week, I don't mean calendar last week. Calendar last week, we were at the birthday. Last week that we did this forum, this situation, last week and the week before where these instincts are explained. The, there's a very good explanation on there. I won't go into this morning. I don't want to take the time because it's all on, on recording. Who or what do you resent? What did they do to you? What instinct or instincts are effective? And then column four, what did you do, if anything, to set the ball in motion? And what character defects within me, within us, are brought to the surface? Very, very simple. You don't need any concordances. You don't need to download anything off the internet if you don't want to. If you do, you want there's forms. You want to use the forms. I'm not that familiar with them. I don't use them. I just do what do the columns like it says in the big book. I don't know, but there are people who love the forms, and there are various uh, varieties of these forms that you can download off the internet. Don't ask me about them because I don't know any more about them than you do. But uh, column four: What did you do to bring this resentment about, and what character defects were brought to the surface? Fear inventory: Who or what do you fear? Column two, why do you fear it? 19 words or less, please. And then column three, what basic instinct or instincts are affected? Column four, what did you do, if anything, to bring this fear about? And then what character defects were brought to the surface? And then your sexual harms. Who did you hurt? This will always be a who, it will never be a what. Who did you hurt in a sexual area? Now, just because you had sex with somebody doesn't mean that they need to go on your inventory. Did you harm them? In other words, did you use your God-given sex powers for something other than what they were intended for? Did you cheat on someone? Did you use your sex powers to manipulate someone? Did you withhold affection? Did you withhold sex to try to bring somebody around to your way of thinking? In other words, I know I'll cut them off at the pass and I will not pay attention to them. I'll give them the cold shoulder. I'll cut them off from any sex or any attention or affection until they come around to my way of thinking. Did you do that to somebody? Did you seduce someone because you knew it would hurt someone else? Did you, did you use your sex powers for something other than what they were intended for. And that's what we're really looking at in that sexual inventory. Okay, column two, who, who, column one, who did you hurt? Column two, what did you do to them? In 19 words or less, please. Column three, what basic instinct or instincts are affected? You would think that it would all be the sex instinct. Nothing could be further from the truth. In most cases, the sex instinct had nothing to do with it. Okay, now column four, what defects of character in you were brought to the surface that caused you to take that action that hurt another person? Column five, what should you have done instead? If you want another review on step four, I suggest you go back to the last recording or the recording before that, and there'll be some wonderful reviews on steps three and steps 
four. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Now we're going to look at steps three and four. And we're going to remember that step four, doing step four is not an end in, unto itself. In other words, temper your expectations. We're on a journey, not a destination. And so step four is just exactly what it says. It is a step in the journey. So temper your expectations. I have seen people eating and I've seen people leave meetings for years because they did their fourth step and they felt somehow like the, the result of doing the fourth step didn't match their unrealistic expectations. Don't let that happen to you. It is a step. It is not the be all and the end all. Okay. Now, <sighs> sorry. Let's take a look at page 72. Now, remember always that in step five, what we're going to be doing for probably the first time in our life is we are going to get out of our head. We're going to get out of here and we're going to give the light of day treatment, I call it. The light of day means we're going to be honest with another person and God about some of the things that I have been holding on to for decades. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but I know about me. There are thoughts that I had about other people and things that I did that I was deeply, deeply ashamed of very deeply ashamed of. I hurt other people along life's path. I was very self-centered. I was very self-involved and I wanted what I wanted and I hurt other people. And I'm deeply embarrassed by that. And what I found out is that even though this won't change what I did, it's nice to know I'm not the only one that does these kind of things. I'm not alone. You see, because I believe that not only the way I treated some people, but I believe that there was a multitude of thoughts in my mind there were a multitude of ideas in my head that I believed egotistically were secret unto me, that I was the only one that acted this way. And I came to find out that nothing could be further from the truth, that I am not alone in these things. And what I found out is that in sharing these things with other people, it put me in touch with this undeniable fact that I am a wounded but human being. I'm wounded, I'm sick, I have regrets, I have remorse, I have all kinds of things that I wish hadn't happened. I treated my mother horribly. She had mental illness. I felt like if I could just be mean enough to her that she would wake up one day and not be mentally ill anymore. But I found out that I'm not the only one that had those kind of crazy thoughts in their head. I didn't treat others all the time as I should have. I ate a lot of food that I shouldn't have eaten and I embarrassed myself along life's path and hurt other people. So with that in mind, let's go to page 72. Into action. Now notice <clears throat> that before we begin a chapter, I always call attention to the magic of the title of the chapter. It doesn't say into thinking. It doesn't say into anything. It says into action. And if you're around me long enough and you, you, you hear me share on these things or in my regular meetings or in my daily life, you will find that I am a believer of this philosophy above everything else. This is not a program for people who need it. This is not a program for people who want it. This is a program for people who do it. I have a progressive disease. My disease is getting worse and worse and worse every day, whether I'm eating 
or not. If chapter three teaches me anything and that the, the man of 30 had years of sobriety, Fred he had long periods of sobriety, Jim had periods of sobriety. What happened when they, when they took a drink? Bam, they weren't back where they were, they were worse. And so as my disease progresses, my recovery must also progress. Isn't that funny how this is the one thing that is so hard for some people to grab that their recovery must also progress. If I'm doing a certain level of activity, I'm calling three people a day or I'm sponsoring four or five people or whatever it is I'm doing, whatever that may be for you, however many calls you're making, however many, whatever you're doing, it must grow deeper and larger as time goes on. For if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, he will surely drink again. Not he might drink again. He should drink again. He, whatever, he will drink again. And for us to drink is to die. So there are many, many warnings about the progressive nature of the disease in the book. And where does this information come from? It comes from Richard Peabody, who in 1930 published a book called The Common Sense of Drinking. And in the book, The Common Sense of Drinking, Peabody believed correctly. Now, there were a lot of things he got wrong. Peabody believed that by changing my habits, by changing my friends, by getting interested in different hobbies, or maybe taking up religion or what have you, that that would cure my alcoholism. And of course, that didn't happen. He published the book, The Common Sense of Drinking in 1930. And so vital was his work, The Common Sense of Drinking, that Bill Wilson's copy of this book is in the AA archives as we are here today. It is in New York in the AA archives. But in 1936, just six years after Peabody published the book, The Common Sense of Drinking, he died drunk of his own alcoholism. And one of the things that he got right, that he passed to us unknowingly, he passed to us that there are the characteristics of alcoholism, the physical allergy and the twist of the mind and the mental blank spot. Nobody is discounting that those are vital and those come from Silkworth. Silkworth, Silkworth gives us that information. But Peabody gives us this information that the disease is permanent and that no matter how long you have taken between compulsive mouthfuls. I don't like to use the word compulsive bites. Bites to me, in my mind, maybe it's just me, I don't know. It's too dainty. Oh, I'll have a mouthful of this or a mouthful of that. No, I am not, I mean, I am not a bite person. I am jam it in, jam it in my mouth so that there's tears coming out of my eyes because I can't breathe. I'm, uh, I'm laughing because next month is February. <clears throat> And in February, my pushers in their green dresses are all around their Girl Scouts with their cookies. And they, those were my drug pushers. And I, I remember back in the day where they didn't sell their cookies in front of a store or in a mall or what have you. They would come to your house and knock on your door to sell the cookies. And I would always buy big amounts of cookies from girls from different trees groups, different groups, because I didn't want them comparing notes. Like an, a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old girl is going to be talking about me. No, I, but you know, that's my crazy brain. And they would come to the house and I'd be jamming these, these cookies in my mouth like they're, like tomorrow had been canceled, that this was the last day on earth. So I better jam those cookies in my mouth as fast and as furiously as I possibly can. So I'm not one to use the word bite. I'm one to use the word mouthful. Mouthful is better for me. But anyway, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, I remember now. Permanent 
progressive and fatal. Permanent, progressive, and fatal. And as we learn through chapter three about these properties, what we find is that if we are going to live free of this disease, we must also keep taking action and more and more and more. Now you may be thinking, I can't do more. I can't, I, I have kids, I have a job or I have a business or I have a, I, I like, to, I have to have a couple hours a day to juggle flaming bowling pins. I couldn't tell you, but all I know is for me, God has cleared out periods of time for me to keep taking these actions and in taking these actions, I have had a much better life. I trust God and it starts with asking him to make room in my life for more and more and more. You know what was funny? Here's a conversation I never had. I'm really busy. I don't think I'm going to make it to uh, the store today to get my cookies. I don't think I'm going to make it to the store today to get my French fries. I don't think I'm going to make it over there to get my candy. That's a conversation I never had. But I do have the conversation. Gosh, I don't think I can sponsor all these people. Where am I going to find the time? I found the time to eat. I have to find the time to recover. I must put at least as much energy into finding the recovery that I did in finding the disease. I lived in Chicago. I found a way to get to Hostess Factory resale shop. I found a way to get to the foods that I wanted. I found a way in snowstorms, in ice storms, in sleep. If you've never been to Chicago in the winter time, you're smarter than me. But I found the time, I found a way to get to these places when the Chicago Police Department was on the radio asking you that if you do not have to go out, please don't. Because there's a high rate of accidents due to the ice covered roads. And there I was, there I was tooling down the street getting ready to get my food on, getting ready to get my feedback on. So the title to this chapter is extremely important to me. And the title is Into Action. Now, one other divergence before we get into this. Remember that there are four impediments to God. And Sam Shoemaker, in a book called Twice Ministered on page 93, describes the four impediments to God. And what is an impediment? An impediment is something which slows or stops progress. It slows or stops progress. So anything that slows or stops progress is going to be a problem. What's the first impediment? a resentment that you will not let go of. That's step four, isn't it? And so many times we hold these resentments and we hold them like dear relatives or loved ones. We feed them and we water them and we spread them around and we share them with others because we feel very self-righteous in these resentments. We feel very justified in resenting certain people, places, institutions, or things. And we love these resentments. Why do we love a resentment so much? Because we can abdicate responsibility for our life we can blame others and we can justify errant nonsense, eating, hating, what have you. What are we, what are we told in chapter five? Resentment is the dubious luxury. Anger is the dubious luxury of normal men. And if we're not normal, then we can't afford that luxury. I would love to drive a Rolls Royce. I live in Scottsdale. There's a lot of money here. You've heard about all the money that's here. It's true. There's a lot of wealth here in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I see Rolls Royces all the time. And I think to myself, man, I deserve one of those, but I can't afford that. 
and I can't afford a resentment either. What's the second of the four impediments? A secret that you will not tell. And that's what we're gonna zero in on today. A secret that you will not tell. Now, does that mean I have to post in the chat session my PIN number and my bank account? No, it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is I have to be prepared to share with someone all the things in my fourth step, my resentments, my fears, and sexual harms. The third of the impediments is a vicarious thrill that you will not stop. What's a vicarious thrill? Lying, stealing, gossiping, backstabbing, manipulating, those are stealing, those are vicarious thrills. And the fourth of the four impediments is a restitution that you will not make. So let's take a look at the second of those impediments, a secret that you will not tell. And let's go to page 72. Having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We have been trying to get a new attitude, a new relationship with our creator and to discover the obstacles in our path. What we're trying to discover here is what has been hurting us. And what we're going to find in step five is with the help of somebody who is knowledgeable and uninvolved. Those are the two qualifications when we find somebody to do step five. Now, let's just say, for example, that for this, for this little scenario here, just for this little scenario here, Maria in Ireland and I our sister and brother. We are sister and brother. And we grown up together and she in Ireland and me in Chicago. No, we are sister and brother and we've grown up together. And uh, um, Barbara E. Barbara in New Jersey happens to be Maria's best friend. She and Maria, Barbara and Maria, they do everything together. They share everything together. They are bosom buddies and everything that one knows, it, that one tells the other one. Is Barbara a logical candidate for me to do a fifth step with? Absolutely flipping not. Absolutely flipping not. Because Barbara may be well steeped in 12 step knowledge, but she is not a person to do a fifth step with because she is very good friends with my sister. And as such, I am going to have resentments or fears or sexual harms that are going to burden her beyond measure in knowing them. So you choose somebody who is knowledgeable yet uninvolved. And that's a lot easier to do today. Now, when it says the obstacles in our path, what they're talking about is the manifestation of defects of character. The manifestation of defects will come out in patterns of behavior. Now, I know people and so do you. Every one of their divorces, every one of their resentments, every one of their problems, it seems, centers around money. I know yet other people who every one of their resentments, every one of their issues centers around I want people to think well of me. And the biggest fear I have is that you won't think well of me. Self-esteem and, and, and that social instinct and that emotional security instinct come out into the forefront. I yet have other people in my life, and so do you, where it seems that everything about them reeks out of sex and, and the pursuit of sex. So. Whatever you are as a human being, these patterns, these obstacles, if you will, the manifestations of our defects are going to come to the surface. Let's continue. I'm on page 72, middle of the first paragraph on the page. We have admitted certain defects. We have ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We have put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. In other words, now I'm aware of how that I'm afraid and that I've been dishonest and I've been selfish 
and I've been self-seeking and so on. But now we're going to dig just a little deeper. And so we're going to expand our awareness of how these defects have putrefied, vandalized, and committed arson to our lives and our dreams and the loved ones closest to us. Let's continue. Now these are about to be cast out. And the way we cast them out is to not only recognize them, not only ask God to remove them, but we are gonna take action in eight and nine, which is gonna right the wrong to the best of our ability. There are three A's of solving a problem. Awareness, acceptance, and action. I'm gonna say that one more time. There are three A's of solving a problem. You must be aware of the problem. You must accept that it is a problem and then you must take action. In step four, we are becoming aware of the problem. In step five, we are accepting the problem. We come to a point of acceptance by telling another person and seeing that they're not passing out. And then in eight and nine, we're going to take action. Awareness, acceptance, action. Let's continue. I think Maria will post that in the chat for us. This requires action on our part which when completed will mean we have admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our defects. This brings us to the fifth step of the program of recovery mentioned in the preceding chapter. This is step five. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing our defects with another person. Now, I know that many of us are very, very self-conscious. Bill Wilson said at the end of his life, we are selfish, immature rebels. Selfish, immature rebels. And we don't want to go through a lot of this process. We don't want to go through a lot of this stuff. Well, it's time to take off that self-conscious hat and just do what the step dictates. Short of first degree murder, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. We think we have done well enough in admitting these things to ourselves. There is doubt about that because again, well, I'm gonna let the book tell you, in actual practice, we usually find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. Things look different up here in my head than they will in the light of day. This disease will flourish and propagate and grow and thrive in darkness. And it will wither and die in the light of day. It will wither and die in the light of day. Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. We will be more reconciled to discussing ourselves with another person when we see good reasons why we should do so. The best reason first, if we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. So if I think for one second that I'm gonna keep certain things secret, I'm kidding myself. I either trust this or I don't. I either trust God or I don't. I'm either gonna live in recovery or I'm not. I'm either gonna stop eating or I'm not. What is my choice to be? And what step am I gonna to need to lean on here I'm gonna to need to lean on two, and then I'm gonna to need to lean on 10. But right now I'm leaning on two, that God has guided me to do this, and that in so doing, I'm gonna be just fine, that it's gonna be okay, and that this process is not going to kill me. God didn't bring me this far to drop me in Lake Michigan now. <clears throat> time after time, Newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have turned to easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. What did Sam Shoemaker teach us? 
The second of the impediments, a secret that you will not tell. Don't worry about what we think of you. Don't worry about what we're going to think of you. You know what we're going to think of you most of the time? I hate to tell you this, and it's the same for me and you and everybody. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We're thinking about ourselves most of the time. Do you sit around thinking about me? Do you sit around thinking about this one or that one? No. And we're not sitting around thinking about you either. It's really not about you. It's about you getting better. It's about you getting better. Don't worry. Don't try to manipulate what we think of you. And you're so wonderful and you're so great. We love you just as you are. But we also see that you're not perfect. We also see that you are a compulsive overeater with all of the inherent difficulties, with all of the inherent uh, uh, situations that that presents us with. Because we already love you. Don't worry about it. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wondered why they fell. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. What is their house cleaning? Step four. Now, the house cleaning asks you to be fearless and thorough. It does not ask you to be perfect. But be honest with what you're putting down. And don't hold anything back that you know of. They took inventory, all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. Again, why? You want us to like you. We already like you. Now recover. Don't worry about what we're thinking about you. We're not thinking about you. We're thinking about us. They only thought they had lost their egoism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves, but they had not learned enough of humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else all their life story. And this is where OA got sidetracked in the late 70s and early 80s when it said we told someone else all our life story. A lot of us started writing autobiographies and on a Saturday afternoon in Greenbrier Park in Chicago, Illinois, I read a guy, uh, he was an Irish guy too. I read him my autobiography. That poor soul sat there with me for a good two, three hours while I read him all the little details about my life. And at the end of it, nothing was accomplished. All we did was waste time. And those are a couple to three hours that I will never, ever get back again. Because we, if we do step four, that is our life story. When I've done step five with a person and I hear about their resentments and I hear about their sexual harms done others and I hear about their fears and I hear about all this stuff, I know more about them than their closest relatives do. I've had friends I'm very lucky. I have friends who live five minutes from here, maybe three minutes from here. We have known each other our entire lives. <laughs> I do not remember a time when I didn't know them. They have been friends of mine my entire life. I know everything about them. I knew their parents. I knew their grandparents. I know their sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles and cousins. And I went to the funerals of their family and I went to the weddings and the bar mitzvahs and all this other stuff. You know more about me than they will ever know. You know more about me, you know right where I live. You know more about me than you know because you are me and I am you. Whether you're male or you're female, whether you're black or white, whether you're Jewish or Catholic or Protestant, Muslim or Buddhist, whether you are whatever it is, you are gay or straight or tall or short, nearsighted or farsighted, you are me and I am you. Maria lives in Ireland. Maria and I have talked here in Scottsdale and at a convention in Newark, New Jersey. And the more I talk to Maria, I realize that even though I've had quite a different life than her, she is me and I am her. And the same would go for any of the other of the 183 people that are on this line right now. We are each other. We have different backgrounds, but we are each other. More than most people, I'm on the second paragraph, first full paragraph of 73. 
More than most people, the alcoholic leads a double life. He is very much the actor. To the outer world, he presents his stage character. This is the one he likes his fellows to see. And that's that stage character. But behind the scenes, I can be very um, love lost. I can be very uh, scared. I can be very angry. I can feel very inferior or, or, or whatever I can feel. And that's why I need step 10. He wants to enjoy a certain reputation, but knows in his heart that he doesn't deserve it. I have felt that way my entire life. I've always been very lucky. I've always had a lot of friends. People love me, even though I gave them a lot of reasons not to love me, they did seem to love me. And I have a ton of friends today. And I wonder sometimes when I hear them and I see them, I don't see them often because of the, of the pandemic that we're in right now. But I often wonder why did they stick with me? Would I have stuck with them under similar circumstances? I like to think so but sometimes I'm not sure. My little friend Snoopy over here, who's right next to me with his sunglasses on, he's been my buddy for a long time too. You see him over there in the corner? That's Snoopy. All right. The inconsistency is made worse by the things he does on his sprees. We do a lot of things we're ashamed of. Coming to his senses, he is revolted at certain episodes he vaguely remembers. These memories are a nightmare. He trembles to think someone might have observed him. As fast as he can, he pushes these memories far inside himself. He hopes they will never see the light of day. He is under constant fear and tension that makes for more drinking. And so I drink, I create fear and tension, and I drink more. You've heard me say this before. If you're new, you haven't. This is something that you will hear me say from time to time. I've eaten railroad cars full of Chips Ahoy cookies to kill the pain of eating railroad cars full of chocolate chip cookies. The more I ate, the more I ate. The shame, the guilt, the remorse of what I was doing was too much for me to bear. I couldn't stand it. I lived the life of a fugitive. I didn't want people to see that I was in line at McDonald's and I had a very recognizable car. I was a very recognizable figure. And there I was and invariably someone would say, hey, I saw your car at McDonald's the other day and I would die a thousand deaths inside and I would try to lie my way out of it. But that person knew I was at McDonald's and I knew I was at McDonald's and it hurt me to have it uh, see the light of day. Psychologists are inclined to agree with us. We have spent thousands of dollars for examinations. We know but few instances where we had given these doctors a fair break. We have sold them, seldom told them the whole truth, nor have we followed their advice. We, I would go to the doctor and they would yell and scream at me, my God, like I just hit their mother with brass knuckles. And, and then they would give me the pink diet. Why are the diets always pink? I wish I knew. Doesn't matter what doctor you go to. It doesn't matter what the situation, the diets are always in pink. I think sometimes the medical profession assumes that all the people that need to lose weight are female. And the striking reality is, is that's not even close to true. So I can't imagine why every doctor who ever handed me a diet in their life, in my life, the diet was pink. It was in pink uh, ink. Unwilling to be honest with these sympathetic men, we were honest with no one else. I didn't even know what honesty was. I lied when the truth would have served me better. Small wonder many, many in the medical profession have a low opinion of alcoholics and their chance for recovery. Don't kid yourself, boys and girls. They also have a low opinion of the morbidly obese. I went to the cardiologist yesterday. And this is the first time I've ever gone there where I didn't have a bunch of OA literature with me because I haven't been to a live meeting since March the 12th, Thursday, March 12th of last year. 
and I was at a live meeting and I said to myself, I'm not coming here anymore. The news last March was getting hot and heavy with this COVID, this coronavirus. And uh, I, um, I just, I stopped going. Uh, so I didn't have an opportunity to bring OA literature there. But anyway, I really like my cardiologist. He's a very, very nice guy, very nice guy. I like him. Um, he and I get along very well and he doesn't yell and scream at me because I don't gain weight. I don't, you know, I'm, I was down three pounds. I go every six months in the last six months, I lost three pounds, which is great, you know, whatever. Anyway, long story short, I'm getting off the point here. I always bring in a lot of OA literature and he laughs at me. He thinks it's a waste of time. And the reason he thinks it's a waste of time is he said to me that none of his patients, except for me, none of them are going to listen to any of it. He says he rants, he raves, he talks to these people, he tells them you're going to die. And then a year later or six months later, he pronounces them dead at the hospital next door. He says it's a waste of time. He asked me one time, is this really true? Did you really weigh 513? Did you weigh 679? I said, yes, this is really true. He said to me, the mathematical odds of someone who has weighed that much of losing the amount of weight that you have lost and keeping it off for over one year are zero. It is so immeasurable. It is so negligible on the statistical chart that this could happen that statistically it is measured as zero chance that you would ever do that. He says, you are a statistical anomaly. He says, you should have been dead years ago. He says, but the rest of my patients are not going to listen. He has a low opinion of compulsive overeaters, a very low opinion of us because his, life, his lifetime teaches him not to waste his time. He says, I'm to the point now where I will look the person in the face and I will say to that person, you weigh too much, you need to lose weight. And that's the last time I'm gonna mention it to that person. He says, I haven't got the strength or the time or the interest to keep harping on these people. It's just not, it's not productive time spent. They're gonna do what they're gonna do very bottom of 73. We must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world. Let's take a look at that sentence because that sentence is a sentence that says something to us that most of the time we don't want to hear. I don't want to be honest with anyone. I want to cook up a story. I don't want to be transparent. I want to be a character in a novel. I want to create a character for myself. And I don't want to be honest with anyone. I don't want to tell you that I was supposed to meet my friend at a Cub game in 1968. And I got involved with another friend. And I lost interest in the first friend. And I never showed up. And I ditched him. And he was crying. And I... I, I never even thought of going back to see if he was waiting for me. I don't want to tell you, I don't want to tell you that there were times when I acted in ways that were embarrassingly ridiculous. I wrote bad checks. I got caught writing bad checks. I lied when the truth would have been better. We must be entirely honest with somebody if we expect to live long or happily in this world. I must be honest if I want to live long and happily. Release myself from the bondage of the lies is what God tells me all the time. Rightly and naturally, we think well before we choose the person or persons with whom to take this intimate and confidential step. You don't have to do your fifth step with just one person. You can do it with as many people as you want to do it with. 
Those of us belonging to a religious denomination, which requires confession, must and of, must and of course will want to go to the properly appointed authority whose duty it is to receive it. Though we have no religious connection, we may still do well to talk with someone ordained by an established religion. We often find such a person quick to see and understand our problem. Of course, we sometimes encounter people who do not understand alcoholics. They just don't get it. And that's, that is what it is. So make the person that you choose an informed person yet uninvolved. It doesn't matter whether you are a, a person that has a religion that requires confession or not. You, you choose the person based on will they understand what we're doing and be helpful and are they involved? If, if you wanna bring it to a psychologist, a doctor, a priest, a minister, a rabbi, do so. That's fine. I'm not saying don't do that. That's perfectly okay. You want to bring it to some whatever clergy person, that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But do the best you can to choose one that understands what it is we're going for here. That's all. That's all I'm asking. It's all we're, not me, it's all the book is asking. If we cannot or would rather not do this, we search our acquaintances for a closed mouth understanding friend. It has to be a person that will keep a confidence. Perhaps our doctor or psychologist will be the person. It may be one of our own family, but we cannot disclose anything to our wives or our parents, which will hurt them and make them unhappy. In other words, you don't have the right to unload on somebody and say, I've always hated you and you're a witch and you're this and you're, you don't have the right to do that. Honesty without love is abuse. Love without honesty is sentimentality. We have no right to save our own skin at another person's expense. We have no right to save our own skin at another person's expense. Such parts of our story we tell to someone who will understand, yet be unaffected. Again, they will understand, yet be unaffected. The rule is we must be hard on ourselves, but always considerate of others. Notwithstanding the great necessity for discussing ourselves with someone, it may be one who is so situated that there is no suitable person available. If that is so, this step may be postponed only, however, if we hold ourselves in complete readiness to go through with it at the first opportunity. Be ready. If you're in a situation where there, you're just, you can't find anyone, which I can't imagine, because today with technology, it shouldn't take you more than five minutes to find somebody that can do it. We say this because we are very anxious that we talk to the right person. It is important that he be able to keep a confidence, that he fully understand and approve what we are, of what we are driving at, that he will not try to change our plan. In other words, don't be doing it with someone who doesn't believe in program, someone who doesn't believe in any of this stuff. It may be very difficult, but we must not use this as a mere excuse to postpone. When we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. We have written it, we have a written inventory and we are prepared for a long talk. We explain to our partner what we are about to do and why we have to do it he should realize that we are engaged upon a life and death errand. This is life and death. You don't do this, you'll be back in the food. Not a question of if, it's a question of when. Most people approached in this way will be glad to help. They will be honored by our confidence. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. What a concept. I don't have to look up at you. I don't have to look down at you. I don't have to judge you. I don't have to character assassinate you in my mind. I don't have to deify you and put you on a pedestal. I don't have to try to kiss your butt so that maybe you'll take care of me and you'll make it so that I don't have to work hard. I don't have to do any of that stuff. I can look at you in the eye. And that's the first time I was ever able to look at anybody 
in the eye. We, are, we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. This is exactly my experience. This is what this did for me. <laughs> our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. For me, it's a spiritual awakening. What's the difference? A spiritual experience is sudden and profound. A spiritual awakening is slow in developing and develops over time. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Now, the next paragraph is vital because it is a specific instruction. It is not to be ignored. It is to be followed to the letter of the law. Returning home, this is after your fifth step, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, not play on your phone, not, not yelling and screaming, not watching television, not listening to music, be quiet for an hour. You can do it. I know it seems daunting. You can do it. Reviewing what we have done, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. How do we know him better? By getting in touch with our own humanity. Taking this book down from our shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals. What are the first five proposals? The, the first five steps. We ask if we have omitted anything for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Answer the question. Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? In other words, were you honest? Did you cover everything you could cover? Nothing has to be perfect. You don't have to beat yourself. But did you do a good job? Did you do a job of being honest about what's going on with you? Now we're going to do steps six and seven. And then we'll be done for the day because we're almost out of time here. The time goes very quickly. Um, all right, anyway, now steps six and seven, very quick, fast steps. There's no ancillary reading. There's no written assignments here. There's none of that stuff. Some sponsors do that. That's up to them. I don't, I just stick to what's in the book. So you have steps six and seven, very small paragraphs because all you're doing is you're going through it quickly and then you're moving on to eight, nine, 10, 11. Now, step six, if we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six, answer what to our satisfaction? We answer to our satisfaction that we have been victimized by our character defects and we have hurt other people. We have been affected by these defects. We have been affected by fear, anger, selfishness, dishonesty. We have had behaviors that hurt other people. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? In other words, are we ready to stop justifying that the reason I hurt you is because you hurt me? Am I ready to let that go? Am I ready to live in the sunlight of the spirit? Am I ready to take these steps and live free of the food, free of the desire to eat? Because once I start this process, I am not going to want the food anymore. I don't eat today because I have willpower. 
I don't eat compulsively today so far because of some inner willpower or some reservoir of inner strength. I am not compulsively overeating today simply because I don't want to. The desire for the food has been removed and one day at a time, it continues to be removed. Can we now take them all, everyone. If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. And what are you willing to let go of? Fear, anger, selfishness, dishonesty. That's what you're selfish, dishonest, resentful, fear. That's what you're ready to let go of, your defects of character. When ready, we say something like this. My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Does that sound like something that's in that third step prayer? Relieve me of the bondage of self. What are the manifestations of self? The manifestations of self are selfishness, dishonesty, anger, and fear. The defects of character are selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. It's the same thing. Notice that it says amen, where it does not say amen in the third step prayer, because you are beginning the process in three, and here you are saying amen. So your inventory process is not just four and three, four and five. It is three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so you're, you're, now it says here, you have then completed step seven. Does it say do any written assignments? No. Does it say read any outside books? No. Does it say make this into something that it's not? No. Quick and fast, quick and easy, I meant. Quick and easy. If you're spending too much time on this stuff, you're probably doing it incorrectly you're probably making more of it than needs to be made. So for next week, when we meet again, we're going to start on page 76 with now we need more. Okay.